All right, guys, let's get started. Good morning. I hope you enjoy your reading week. Apparently, many of your friends couldn't make it today. Yeah, waking up after, after a week of holidays is kind of hard, I know. Uh, so today, we, we're going to talk about convolution on neural network. Um, I've already put the slides uh, on, on Quercus because uh, this, this lecture will be involved with uh, many slides. So we want to make sure that we finish it within an hour. So you can refer to the slides. It's under uh, lecture one um, on Quercus. Also, I'm going to put it in my own set of slides after the class as well. Um, this this won't be uh, this won't be taken into account on your midterm, but it's it's always good to know one of the uh, major successful actually uh, deep learning models as CNNs. All right, so let's see. Um, this is a very high level overview of uh, deep learning within the AI and ML based models. So you see that when, when people refer to AI normally or when they, refer it, uh, when they are referring to it casually most of the time, uh, so it's it contains the bag of all machine learning brain inspired neural network deep learning stuff inside. So that's a very high level uh, classification. So you go inside, you have ML based techniques, and then within those, you have either a spiking or neural network. So spiking is exactly what um, a, real uh, a real neural network, uh, for instance, on your brain does a job. Uh, it, it it more it is more closely related to natural uh, neural network. Uh, so in addition to uh, neural and synaptic states, so you're going to have spikes as well to 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 generate the the flow of information. So what the artificial neural network brought was to mimic sort of the spiking version of the uh, these models. And that's why they are so successful. Now we have some newer models that use as actually spiking uh, brain inspired models that are um, becoming more apparent recently that they might work as well. So I've seen uh, a couple of papers on this domain as well. All right, so when, when you step inside the, the neural network, one of the subset of those is deep learning. We already started with the with stacking up multiple layers of perceptrons, and we, we talked about deep neural network, so DNNs. When you have many of those layers, many of the hidden layers, um, so that's going to be referred to that. So within the the bag of neural network, you see that there's a there's all sort of uh, different applications with neural network starting from perceptron that you already know and then feed forward network and then going to deep neural network to so deep feed, feed forward network and then on the the sequence domain we're going to have the RNNs and then later on the next generation of RNNs which was LSTMs having those forget gates in order to compensate the the, um, the vanishing gradient problem they had and on the representation side, so here, so we're going to have autoencoders that are the nonlinear transformation of data. So you see the, the number of inputs you have is equal to number of outputs, but they are sort of, uh, it's a, it's a nonlinear combination of that. So it's, it's sort of a, a modern PCA uh, in which PCA does the linear combination for you, but Autoencoders actually learn how to present your data uh, in a nonlinear format. And you're going to have a sparse version of those as well. And these are the next generation of Markov chain and then Boltzmann machine and all those stuff. So I just brought this up to see that, to see all those bag of uh, neural networks. So each of them has its own research ongoing. And within each of those, there are so many problems that are actively being uh, tackled by researchers. All right, so now we're going to focus on CNNs mostly, or deep convolutional neural network. So they're mostly the same as uh, a DNN, so 
deep neural network with the difference that they their input instead of any uh, any sample data like sequences or uh, audio video anything they are mostly images so their input are images so you are involved with several pixels of images if they have multiple channels uh, or if they are 3D or 2D so you can have different type of input so the major difference between uh, CNN and DNN is in order to adapt to that input which are images people started to realize if they want to use neural network itself it, it won't be necessarily efficient to uh, to compute the feed forward and backward pass because if you start from if you start from an um, input image say you have an input image of 24 pixel by 24 and say you have multiple channel of that so like Suppose it's an RGB, so you have some other channels here, say three. So if you want to use a DNN, the first layer without any downsampling that we discussed before, without any down downsampling your, uh, of your dimension or uh, dimension reduction technique, you're going to have you have to input 24, multiply 24, multiply 3, right, as your input layer so that you pass it to the next layer, right, and then it's going to go on. So that your input layer must have this value. So supposing in, in bigger um, data sets like ImageNet, you're going to have 299, 299 multiply, uh, multiply by 3, so you see that just the first layer is going to be a huge layer because you have to pass over all those pixels here. So you're starting from here, going down, and then going to the depth. So you're going to have multiple neurons here. And simply calculating those are not going to be efficient. So the way people came up with the idea of a convolution layer is that it convolves with your input in, in a more efficient way. We're going to discuss it later. Uh, so that we still be able to gain enough of information from our input, yet it's more efficient uh, and has lower parameters than a standard NN. All right, yeah, so just like I brought this up. So CIFAR 10 is one of the data set which has 10 classes, that's why it is called C410. We have another variation of that called C400 that has 100 classes. So those classes are like cars, buses, uh, cats, dogs, so simple things. So those images are 32 by 32 by 3. So as I mentioned, your first layer would need to have around 3,000 parameters as your weight to start with. And then ImageNet with various sizes up to 299. So you're gonna have, you see that just your first layer starts with 268K weight. So definitely calculation would be not efficient if you wanna keep training your model and going feet forward and backward pass. All right, um, so let's talk about a generic CNN. How are we gonna define uh, one? So just like the, the previous DNNs you had, so suppose you start with inputting your input data, in this case is your image, and then you start to, to apply convolution layers. So in this case, we had two, two conv layers, so like conv1 and then conv2. And each of those, depending on the the weights that you learn through your training and the size of the, the convolution and the nonlinearity after that as activations and other modules that we're going to talk about, like batch norm, like pooling layers. So they're going to they're gonna, um, be used to extract certain level of features from your input. For instance, 
the earlier layers after your input, they're gonna gain some low-level features. So by low-level features, I'm talking about edge detection, like detecting corners when it convolves, like each of the corners. So you're gonna have several of those here. And then the more you go in depth towards the last class, which normally a fully connected one, whereas uh, the rest are convolution. So after stacking up all those lower level features here, you see, you're going to gain some higher level knowledge from your input. You understand some portion of the, um, the image, you might, so these layers might, you might see like, uh, one eye or a part of a hand or some vectors so they are more meaningful because they are representing more high level features and after all the final layer because you need to classify the output of this must represent certain probabilities so normally that FC layer at the end involves with the softmax and depending on the classes that you train on, so for instance, for the CFR10, you're going to have 10. So that's 10. And you're going to sort it by the, the, the highest probability. So it's going to say like 92%, 0.92. So it refers to class number 3, for instance, and that was like human. And like 0.4, like class number eight, like which was cat. And through that, you're gonna classify your images. So now we're gonna zoom in into each of those convolution layers to see how they're gonna extract this knowledge within uh, their layer. Any questions so far? All right. So this is um, one of the early successful models in late 90s. It's called Lennet 5. The, the author was um, Jan, uh, Jan LeCun. And that was the first, uh, that, that was the fifth generation of um, LeCun's model. That's why it's called Lennet 5. So in 1998, he was able to classify the MNES dataset. So as you knew, previously MNES dataset were involved with a uh, bunch of um, around 10K test images of um, handwritten digits. So you're going to have 10 classes. That's why the output has 10 here. So basically, Lennet had two convolutions. So comp number one and the other one, number two, before the FC here. So that was... Two, one. And then at the end, you had an FC layer to correlate that in a fully connected manner towards your output. So you see that the, so the input image was 32 by 32, and the first convolution had six channels. So each of those channels, think about it as um, maybe if, if you are talking about a, a, a colorful image, it's going to be RGB, could be RGB, could be the grayscale. In this case, there were handwritten digits, so they were grayscale already. So you could think about it as sharpness of the, of the input, um, transparency, uh, the grayscale level, and so on and so forth. So they had six So here. feature maps of 28 by 28. So each of them starts convolving with, normally from here, going here and going down, and they would generate feature maps. That's, that's why the more you go in depth into a network, it's gonna get longer and longer and longer. Because you expand the features 
from the, from the lower level to a high level features. And at the end, you would have a large FC layer connected to the output. So now we're going to talk about how this convolution layer actually works convolved with, with, um, with an input image. And it's, uh, it is worth mention that this one was um, classifying images by over 90%. So back, back in the 90s, it was a pretty big deal. Uh, that was one of the successful applications of, one of the early successful applications of CNNs. I mean, you, it, it wasn't a deep model because it had only two comms and in total five layers, but that was a good starting point. So every year from 2009, um, in ImageNet classification competition, people were sent, submitting their, um, their CNN models to classify ImageNet data sets, test, test data set, right? So the breakthrough happened in 2012 when AlexNet started the very first deep neural network here. So that's the AlexNet paper. So you see they could reduce the the top five accuracy by a huge amount. So AlexNet's uh, top one accuracy was almost 57 or 58. But top five is almost uh, 82 or 83. We have so many different versions. So you might see, so that's the top five. That's the top one. So here we're talking about the top five classification. So depending on the version of AlexNet, you have around from 79 to 84 as top five. So you see from 2011, you had a huge jump here. And then people started to realize we can stack up multiple layers of CNN, and that would be called a deep CNN-based design. And it goes, the, the trend carries on and on with um, Google, Google Net then started to be realized that in section version one, two, three, and four, and then we had uh, VGG, and 2015 the, the winner was uh, ResNet. With a top five accuracy of 96%, so like 4% error, which is, which is pretty good. And as you see, the, the human's average classification error is, is almost 5%, so resin is outperforming human uh, classification as well. All right, so let's see what are the differences between a fully connected layer or, or FC layer and a convolutional layer. <clears throat> so you've already, uh, for most of your neural network um, lectures, we've been talking about the FC layers. So FC layers are normally a linear matrix multiplication because all the neurons are fully connected to each other, right? From the pre previous layer, <clears throat> and they're going to connect it to the next layer. Just like this. So that represents um, a fully connected layer. However, a convolution layer are also sort of a linear operation between the input and the current weight of the layer, but they are involved with a smaller kernel like this, normally three by three by, by, the, by the number of channels they have, I would call it C. It could be two, three, or five, or recently they have found that five to five is also very efficient. So instead of Instead of applying a fully connected layer, so the, the whole matrix multiplication between the two uh, different layers, you will start to convolve in a loop, left to right, up and down, and also in depth. So that's how we convolve this. So as an example I put here, so you see the, the weights of this kernel, so it represents uh, a Sobel kernel. So the weights are minus one, minus two, minus one, and the, the second column is zero, and that one is like the, the flip inside of this. So plus one, two, and one. So in order to generate this pixel, 
as the, de as the destination pixel for the next layer, you have to apply minus one up, uh, multiplied by three, which was here, and then you carry on zero to zero, one, one, and then so on and so forth, and the output is minus three. So this is for the case that you, you have only one channel, so your C was one. If you see you have multiple channels, and this one has multiple layers as well, so you're gonna enter in two more loops, one for the input and one for the kernel. And then there are other uh, intermediate layers involved. How you're gonna decide which number would be the output, and that's gonna be called a pooling layer that I'm, uh, that I'm gonna show it in the next slide. So you see that each neuron in the current layer concerns only a small local region here, right? Instead of, the, instead of all the neurons in the previous layer. Thus, we're gonna have shear weight extensively through our weights here because you are trying to convolve this throughout all the layers here. So the feature maps, in the feature maps, weights are shared extensively. And people have found that this, this way of gaining information from uh, an input image is going to be more efficient and the accuracy is also be higher. So, let's talk about a basic convolution in 2D now. So suppose you want to, this is your filter. Oh, sorry. That was your weight. So that's your filter weight. And that's your input image, right? Or one of the intermediate layers in, in, in inside your network. So the first layer is going to be your input image. The rest of the layers might be the output of one of those previous layers. So in order to generate this pixel here, You need to convolve your filter weight to this section of your image. Normally, those corner side pixels, in order to generate those, you have to have you have to add another column or vector here, row, at some point to your input image, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't you have to add this tree. And this addition is called pooling. No, I'm sorry, padding uh, in com convolutional neural networks. So padding. So we have, if you take a look at the, the the libraries like TensorFlow or Cafe, so they have different versions like zero padding. So like they're gonna put zeros here, or they're gonna replicate the last pixel here, and then they, they use it there. So you need to have some padding in the corners because you need to compute the corner pixels here. And if you carry on in a loop, so computing this pixel would be equal to use the, your filter weights with this one. No padding needed because you are inside. And that one, you go one step further. So your, your window would go one step further. So this moving of your window of, of your weight throughout your input is called also a stride. So in this case, a stride was one. We can have multiple number for a stride, like you can have a stride of two, three. So it, it, these are all designer's choice. Uh, whenever you are working with a, with a CNN, all these hyperparameters have been defined. You can see it in the code, actually, and they have iteratively they have found that using a stride of one in that layer with, with zero padding would be um, would outperform the rest of the, the hyperparameters the authors were trying uh, were trying to apply. So it's totally up to designer's choice. Um, sometimes we call it voodoo science as well. So 
So that's the whole uh, high level view. As I mentioned, when you have When you have multiple channels of kernel, each of those will bring you some set of results as the output of the multiplication you had. So you need to have a pooling layer. In this case, we have a two by two pooling layer with a stride of two because when we, so the step one would be here, step two would be here. So we're gonna have a stride of two here. And then the next one would be here, right? And also the stride could be both vertical and horizontal. That would be here again. So normally we have two different pooling layers, max pooling and average pooling. So these are designed to generate a number out of your pool size. So in this case, it was two by two. So you want to make sure when you are down sampling to the to the next layer, so you want to extract one number out of these four. With the max pooling technique, you're going to pick up the max number, which is 23, and 9 here, 12, uh, 12 here, and 5. With the average pooling, you have to make an average from these four because it was 2 by 2, and you're going to have average pooling there. Right? All right, so I found this uh, very intuitive uh, animation of a convolutional neural network. So it was in the course of uh, Andre Carpacci. So I, I left the link here if you wanted to have a look. So, so here in this case, we have a, this is our input values. You see all the corners are zero. So there are zero padded. So plus padded with, with one. So one zeros in the corner. So your input was seven by seven by three. So this one represents the seven by seven and three instances. So it would be seven by seven. Your one, seven by seven. Second layer, seven by seven. Third, actually third channel. Okay. And we had a filter three by three by three. So the the width and height was three by three, but since the third dimension was three, so we have three of those. So W zero. Uh, and we had two of two set of those as well. So we had W1 and W0. So six of them, right? And the output value, because of this three by three, and two sets of W0 and W1 is three by three by two. So the convolution result, the result of this tree by this tree would map to this one, O, all, all of the values and zero. And the, the output of this tree with your tree input would result in O, all, all, the, all the parameters, and 1. So you can see it here that in order to generate each of these points, so now we're going to use this tree for this point, this point, this point. So now you see that uh, the, the difference between a, a convolution layer, a conv layer, and a fully connected layer is apparent here. So you don't have to uh, apply all the layers to, to, its, to its pair with, with the matrix multiplication, but you do it uh, more, I would say, in a smart way because your filters are smaller. They contain more channel, so you can gain more information with, with, an, with a more efficient way. Any questions so far? Was it was it clear? All right. Having said that, if you want to design um, a two D convolution in in Python in a very naive way, so you're going to be involved with a seven seven loop. So this one. So you have to loop three times over the shape of your filter, three times 
over the shape of your input and depending on the number of batches you're going to have your seventh loop right so three here three here and number of batches so number of batches people have so in training a CNN instead of passing each images one by one so the first one goes you're going to have a feed forward and then you're going to have a backward and you would have some gradients and then you would change your weights right instead of passing it one by one and it would go like 2 10 up to n people realize what if we send a batch of b numbers at the same time and we do the feed forward instead of um, doing the backward b time we, we simply add those gradients together like the first one the first feed forward would give us a gradient of 0 0.1 right this the, the second one would give us 5 and then up to the the number of batches which was like here maybe minus 2 okay and then we simply add up all these and it would give us 52 and we would do one backward pass after each of the batches and this will speed up a lot your training uh, because instead of so suppose you want to train it with ImageNet you're gonna have a million images but you could have done it with a batch of 50 so you would downsample it by a factor of 50 also people notice that using a batch training will decrease the chance of getting um, saturated in uh, flat or flat two points also it's gonna help not to um, not to run into other issues so it'll give you a, a better property when you train the batches so that's why you have the seventh four here and the other thing I, want, I wanted to mention that here is although this is a 2D uh, this, this process resembles a 3D convolution because you are working in 3D depth and 3D images but this is called a 2D convolution because this shape convolve with your image in 2D stacks it doesn't convolve it in 3D stack that's why it is still called a 2D convolution a multiple channel 2D convolution in 3D mode so nowadays people have started to research on a pure 3D convolution but it's not uh, efficient as of yet so most of the models you knew AlexNet, MobileNet, ResNet um, VGG and all, all those stuff are actually using 2D convolutions with multiple channels. So, so don't get confused when you see Conv2D in, in, that, in those models. They're still applying within a 3D image, but their convolving is in 2D. Was that clear? All right. So just like the just like the uh, needed nonlinearities in neural network, we have the same nonlinearities here. So sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, ReLU, and the other variants of ReLU. So we're going to use it here. So you already know them. Um, I'm just going to skip them fast. So each of them gives uh, a different property. So like sigmoid outputs from zero to one, hyperbolic tangent goes from minus one to one, and ReLU was uh, giving us many zeros for all the negative points and the rest would be X so it would be a nice feature when we do the backdrop it would make it easier to the backdrop all right so that's the that's a sample confident that was applied uh, I guess this is a C410 data set you have 10 different classes, cars, trucks, planes, horses. So you see that you have, in this case, you have six convolution. A after each of those convolution, you had a ReLU here to add in nonlinearity. So that was your first layer. And that would be your second layer. And then we had a pooling layer, either a max pooling or average pooling to downsample it again. And then you convolve with your third layer fourth layer another pooling 
again with an, the, the last pulling. And the final FC gives you probabilities of a car like with 90 something percent. This input image could be classified as a car. And you see, if you take a look at these feature maps, the activation maps that comes out of the conclusions, you see starting from the beginning, the, um, those those earlier are only detecting edges or very low level features, but the more you go at the end, it resembles more higher level features of, of your image. Um, and that, that's how it works. All right, let's just, um, in the final set of a slide, let's just formalize what a convolution is. So we have another thing called cross correlation and given an input, given an input image i and a filter or a kernel k and a kernel k had the dimension of k1 and k2 the cross validation is actually the the matrix multiplication in, in 3D uh, in this case we had k1 and k2 so the, the summation of uh, the first dimension m and a summation of the second dimension of your i's and k's right but conclusion is the same as a cross correlation with a flip of image. So it's as if it's as if you do that and you do a flip of kernel, so your m goes to minus m and your n goes to minus n. So you see that the difference between a cross correlation and a convolution is that the convolution is a cross correlation with a flip of uh, both vertically and both horizontally of your kernels. So it's, suppose you have your kernels, if you do it this way, it's a cross correlation. If you flip it both ways and do the uh, and do the, the multiplication, it's going to be called convolution. So these are the two different things uh, that, that you're going to see a lot in, uh, in the literature or, or if you want to play around with the libraries. Yeah. So the flip kernel is actually happening for the K. Sometimes in in symmetric kernels, if your K was symmetric, uh, these two will will match each other because um, they're symmetric. So when you flip it, you're gonna have the same thing. So people have realized that if, he, if they use this way, flipping kernel of a cross correlation, yeah, it will give them more nicer properties, like associ associativity and other things when they apply this on their model, which, whereas they, uh, they, they, they didn't have these uh, features when they were using cross correlation. All right? I'm just going to go super fast on the on the feed forward and backward pass of CNNs because it resembles the same thing you, you, you saw in your neural network lectures. So I'm just going super fast here. So we are defining the, the input maps as the height, width, and channel. So I mentioned that you're gonna, you might see another fourth dimension here as the number of batches. But in this case, we are talking about individual images. So we have only H, W, and C within the R space. And then you have biases as well. So my power point is let's see today. So that's gonna be your convolution. Your channels, your height and width. And you want to add the biases after that. So this is the biases. This is your filter, kernel, and this is your input image, right? So assuming you are, invo you are dealing with a grayscale image with only one channel, so you would just cross this, crisscross this, and it would bring down to only two summations instead of three, right? In a simplified case, 
you would have this. Having C equal to 1. All right. So I'm just going super fast on, on the notations. You have the slides online, so you can refer to it. So we just want to make sure everything has been um, settled here. So L normally represents the number of layers. So um, the, 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 the capital L is going to be the last. L equal to 1 is the first. And input has I and J iterations. So this is i and j, here i and j as, and in your filter kernels, in, in the case of 2D filter, you have k1 and k2. You could have a, a third dimension for your filter as well. And WL of m and m is going to represent a weight matrix concerning connecting the neurons of layer L within its previous layer L minus 1. And B of L is the biases, the bias unit of layer L. Normally, we, uh, we put on top or on the bottom of the, the layer. Okay. So X L I and J is going to be the convolved input vector. So two summations and your weight plus the biases, and the output is going to be represented by O L. I and J, the output vector, which is going to be the nonlinear function of this. It involves with a nonlinear activation such as ReLU, um, hyperbolic tangent, or other nonlinear function, right? And we define f of f function as one of those. So these are just like all the things that you, you already know from the, the neural network. So I just left them here for your reference. Um, all right. So, in a high level, you are this is your this is your kernel, and this is your input feature map. So, you're going to convolve it. You're going to have a you're going to have an output, and then you apply a pooling layer to downsample the size depending on the size of the pooling layer. So one by one, two by two. All right. The error, the same as before, would be calculated as, in this case, as a least square method. So the, the, difference, uh, the, uh, the difference between your estimated value and the true value raised by two. And in training, you want to minimize this error for your omega um, parameters, which were the weights in each layer, W1 up to WL. So these are the same thing you had. So let's just talk about a, a simple pitfall in CNN. So people have, have been thinking, okay, so if we just stack up all these layers randomly and we're going to come up with a new network, it just magically will work. And I just brought this um, CNN a quotation of uh, Andre Karpati, so who is the uh, previous um, PhD graduate of Stanford, and now he is the head of AI at Tesla. Uh, so he says that it's, it's easy to fall into the trap of abstracting away the learning process, believing that you can simply stack arbitrary layers together and backprop will magically find them, right? Make them work. But it's not the case. So in many cases, you have, because of the, the way you set up your network, you're going to have zero as your derivative. So you're going to stuck in uh, plateaus here. Or in, for the, if you use ReLU function uh, carelessly, so you're going to have some zeros or dead neurons here. And so many other problems. So I, I, I left this link. It's a good read. You can have a look later if you were interested. Okay. So just like the previous way, the forward path goes from your input, x and y, 
your F and Z output, the backward pass would use the partials to update each of those that related to this. So I'm just going to leave, leave them here. You can have a look later. So basically, basically in a backward pass, you want to come up with a difference in X's given the, 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 the partials of the output towards the, towards the kernel weight and then use those partial again to come back and change the, the inputs here. So also, I'm just going to leave it here. How are we going to calculate all those partials for W1 up to W22? And um, also, this is an interesting project. You can play around. It's all in JavaScript. So let me see if I can put it here. So I left a link here. So suppose. So this is your simple convolution layer. So they call it ConvNet.js because it's on JavaScript. So let me just make it easier to understand. Let me just remove this. So you see here is our in input data, which is nonlinear, right? So the greens and reds, the, there was no way to classify them. We just one classifier like a perceptron. So here you can see that. Um, yeah, here you can see that you have six neurons. To classify this, so based on your knowledge, what do you think the minimum number of neurons that was needed here instead of six to classify this data set? What do you think? Any ideas? So now you see, using these six neurons, I'm perfectly able to classify greens and reds. And this is the realization, so the, the granularity that I can play around. But what was the minimum number, you think? So instead of six, could I do it with one? Still early in the morning. <laughs> Just give it a number. <laughs> so you see here, um, this data, if even if you use four, you see it is it is still able to classify those greens and reds. Also, if you use three. You would be able to do that, right? Because tree is still do the job. Oh. Tree still does the job, like one here, one there, and one here, right? That would be the minimum. And you still you see that you have a perfect classification between the reds and blue. But if I go break it down to two, because it's nonlinear. So now I have some misclassifications of red here, and that's why these two are mixed up, right? So two would be not working. The minimum one was three in this case. All right, so this is a very nice uh, intuitive thing. You can play around and add your own layers, and it's going to run right away on, on, on your browser. So I left it here as well. So, and the the effect of the hyperparameters such as regularization is that the more you go, 
the more you bring it down, you see that you have higher granularities here in your classification, whereas if you have it 0 0.1, it's going to be flatter. Okay? So the rest of the slides, which are only four or five, I just brought some of the well-known architectures of deep convolutional neural networks. So that was the uh, AlexNet presented in NIPS 2012. So you see that it had more than 60 million weights and 400, uh, 724 million max. So max represents the multiplication and addition. So it's one of the metrics in convolutions to represent the, the computations needed. So it's mult addition. So call it max. Then later on, so that's going to be the definition of those five layers you had in AlexNet. Each of the channels, each of the filter size. So your first filter size was the highest one, 11 by 11, and then your second filter was 5 by 5, and the rest of the three were 3 by 3. And you see between each of those filter size, you had this number of filters stacking up in 3D with different channels, right? Then 2014, the, the winner was GoogleNet, which later was known as Inception version 1. So they introduced smaller convolutions, one by one, and each of those bag of one by one, three by three, and five by five was called an Inception layer. That's why later it was known as Inception. So you see, it's, it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper with nine inception layers, is each of those inception layers involved with five or six individual smaller neural network, uh, smaller convolutions. Then ResNet was, was the winner of 2015. It was playing around with um, residuals. So if you were interested, you can have a look. And as a summary, you see that starting from Lenet 5 in late 90s, you were involved with 2.6 only number of weights and now with ResNet 50, we're going to be having 23 million parameters. And the number of multiplication and addition is, is almost uh, exploded, right? So you see that the, the need for computation for recent CNNs are more and more apparent. All right, I, I left some further reading if you wanted to have a look at uh, those papers or the, the course on CNN by Andre Carpacci. So you can have it, and I've, <clears throat> I've uploaded on the, the Quarkus as well, so you can access it anytime you need it. All right, any questions? All right.